Good evening, everyone. Let us start tonight's service by reciting the congregational prayer. The words will be shown for you. You can follow along, please. We offer our salutations to the all-loving being who endows all beings with consciousness. We meditate on the Lord, who is the origin of the universe. Lord, thou abidest in all. Thou art all. Thou assumest all forms. Thou art the origin and goal of all. Thou art the self of all. Thou art existence, knowledge, and bliss. Salutations unto thee. May the world be peaceful. May the wicked become gentle. May all creatures think of mutual welfare. May our, our minds be occupied with what is spiritual and abiding. May our hearts be immersed in selfless love for the Lord. Peace, peace. Peace be unto all. Tonight is the second in a series of guest speakers while Swami Yogatmananda is away in India. We have a very special guest speaker with us tonight. He's um, a well-acclaimed speaker, somewhat famous on the internet for very engaging um, talks. He's been here in the past to do retreats. Uh, when he came for the last retreat, I got a call from a friend of mine who lives all the way up in New Hampshire, and he said, oh, you won't guess who's coming to Vedanta in Providence. And he had been following this Swamiji for a long time on, on the YouTube. So uh, I think I gave away the secret last week, telling you his topic in advance, um, but I think it's okay um, because it's given as an open secret. Um, that graphic that is showing there reminded me when Nagita Prana was here last time, she said uh, there's two types of goddesses. You can worship one goddess who will be kind and open the door and wait for the devotee to walk through. But the second type of goddess doesn't even open the door, she just drags you in through the keyhole. And uh, I'm not sure if that's going to be part of Swamiji's talk tonight, but the graphic reminded me of that. Uh, she never elaborated on what getting dragged through the keyhole is. Um, but I can guess from the words, it's probably not a pleasant experience. So again, with uh, please welcome our uh, dear Swamiji tonight. He's from the Vedanta Center of New York, um, and the topic is open secret. Please welcome Swami Sava Priyananda. Om. Asatoma Sadgamaya, Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya, Mrityurma Amritam Gamaya, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Om, lead us from the unreal to the real, lead us from darkness unto light, lead us from death to immortality. Om, peace, peace. Peace. A very good evening to all of you, and I'm very happy to be here this evening back in uh, Vedanta Society of Providence once again. I was here last year uh, for a retreat on the Kata Upanishad, as far as I remember. This evening, I decided to speak about the highest, nothing less than that. The final truth, the ultimate truth, nothing be beyond which there would be only be silence. So, you see, Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, the literature is vast. At the source, at the root, at the foundation lies the Upanishads. In fact, Vedanta is literally Vedanta Nama Upanishad Pramanam. Vedanta is the source of spiritual knowledge called the Upanishads. So those texts which are from the Vedas, those are at the, at the basis of Vedanta. But after that, you've got many, many texts. It's, it's a huge literature. You have the commentaries and the Upanishads. You have the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, Sri Krishna gives you the essence of the Upanishads in the Bhagavad Gita. You have the commentaries on the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita, written by Shankaracharya in Advaita Vedanta. And other systems of Vedanta, other great Acharyas, Masters have written commentaries. There are independent works composed by great masters over the centuries. You have introductory texts like um, um, Vivek Churamani, which is, which is very popular. Uh, you have texts like 
um, the Vedanta Sara, Vedanta Parivasha, to which, through which students are introduced into Vedanta. Uh, you have a whole series of commentaries and sub-commentaries and sub-sub-commentaries, Bhashya, Vartika, uh, Tika, Tippani, uh, things like that. And uh, you have extraordinarily difficult, very dense works, dialectical works, like uh, Advaita Siddhi, uh, Khandana Khanda Khadya, uh, Chit Sukhi. These are very di extremely difficult works. And they, they are philosophically very abstruse, very sophisticated. Any question you can think about when you're studying non-dualism, those questions are there and the answers have been given. And many, many questions you would never even think about. So those questions are also there and uh, they have been discussed and I think to satisfaction. There is another category of texts of which the jewel, I would say, the crown in the jewel is, the jewel in the crown is the Ashtavakra, which is, uh, uh, it's called the Song of the Sage, Ashtavakra, Ashtavakra Gita, where you don't find um, old, the, the, the ancient Vedic approach which you find in the Upanishads, nor do you find very simplified introduction to the philosophy of Vedanta which you find in the introductory texts like Vedanta Sara, nor is there any attempt at very abstruse argumentation, uh, very subtle argumentation, nor any, any magic of language. This text, the Ashtavakra, no argumentation there. No attempt at even poetry there. No um, fancy language, no, no de not even very, very abstruse philosophy there. Only the highest truth that you are Brahman, that our real nature, that is hammered in again and again and again in a grand monotony throughout the text, without any compromise whatsoever. Remarkable. Um, I can think of no higher text, but it's not good as an introductory text. text. It can do damage as an introductory text. There are uh, uh, people who have been uh, uh, misled or, uh, you know, they have become over-enthusiastic, carried away. One needs to have a grounding in Vedanta. One needs to be a bit of a vet veteran in Vedanta before you can safely approach this text. But that's what we'll do this evening. We'll approach this text, we'll take up this text. Um, one of the best translations I have come across of this text. In, in our order, we have the beautiful translation by Swami Nitya Swarupananda, Ashtavakra Sanghita, you can find that. I think you'll find it in the book, bookshop here. A very um, beautifully literate translation by Professor Byram. No, not the poet Byron, Byram, B-Y-R-O-M. He was a professor of English here in trained in Oxford and he taught in America. He passed away a few years ago. He made a beautiful translation of this book. Um, Ashtavakra, the heart of awareness. The heart of awareness. Really beautiful translation. I mean, just to read it will put you into a state of deep non-dual meditation. Um, he writes in the introduction that when all the philosophies have spoken, all the scriptures of humanity have spoken and have fall, fallen silent, Ashtavakra begins at that point. The words are so luminous, they appear to glide off the pages of the book. We will see today what he means. I, I'll take up just one verse from this, this remarkable book, Ashtavakra. And um, before that, a little bit of caution before we go into it. Ashtavakra does not mean that you will, not, you will give up meditation. It does not mean that you will give up your worship and prayer. It does not mean, uh, it can have that effect. I remember I was in the Himalayas once and there was uh, this gentleman who had retired from a government job in Dehradun and who was staying in the cottage next to mine, um, a lay person. He told me, he was reading the Ashtavakra and he told me, Swami, here is the real truth. And my guru had deceived me all this time. <laughs> I, I, he told me about his guru, I, whom I know about. He was a very good sadhu, very good monk. Here is the truth. 
And what does my guru do? He puts water on the tulsi plant and he uh, fasts and uh, he um, uh, feeds the cows and he worships God in this form and all sorts of dualistic practices. And I've been misled. Here is the real truth. So I as asked him, do you think your guru has read the Ashtavakra? He said, yes, no doubt he has. And do you think he has understood it at least as well as you have understood it? He said, I guess so. And after that also he waters the tulsi plant and he does the puja and the prayer. He said, yeah, that's true. Well, I think about that. Why does he do that? Yeah, so I met this young man who was working in Wall Street in an investment firm in, in America in Wall, uh, in Wall Street. I met him in, a, in an ashram in the Himalayas. He was sitting under a tree and looking rather worried. I said, what's wrong? He said, look. I have not realized God yet. I'm not enlightened yet. I've been trying for nearly one and a half months. I said, well, it's going to take a little bit longer than that. No, 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 Swami, you don't understand. I've got leave from my job for two months. It's almost over. I have to finish, get enlightened and go back and join my job. I said, that doesn't quite work that way anyway. <laughs> so, so he was reading Dashtavakra, sitting under a tree and reading that. So it can have unintended consequences. So take it with, with that kind of uh, caution. It's powerful stuff. It's really powerful stuff. Just one verse. We'll take that up this evening and meditate upon that. Let's meditate upon that verse together. The verse goes like this. It's the 12th verse of the first chapter. Just one. Any, anyone could do. As I said, the whole of the book is full of verses like this. Any one of them or each of them expresses the highest realization. So, in, you know, in Vedanta, there are three stages of studying, uh, of learning Vedanta. Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana, three components. One is, you study these truths, you listen to them, you study them systematically. Shravana, literally it means hearing. So when you're coming here and listening to Vedanta, you are doing that actually. But then you must, it must be followed up by thinking, by reasoning, by trying to penetrate into what you have heard and, and, and got. So that part is called mananam, literally means reasoning or, or cogitation. And finally, once you're convinced of it, once a clarity has come, you must dwell on it, assimilate the truth through meditating on what you have got. So that meditation, a Vedantic meditation is called nididhyasana. So three sta stages, you might say, three components of learning Vedanta. Hearing about this, reasoning about it, and then meditating upon, upon what you have got. And there are some books which are strong. Upanishads are meant for study and listening to those truths, Shravana. There are some truths which are heavy on philosophical argumentation, on reasoning. But there are some books which I like to think of as Vedantic meditation books. In the final stage, when you have gone through all of that and you just want to stabilize, settle down, soak yourself in the Vedantic, in the non-dual Vedantic conclusion. For that, books like Ashtavakra are useful. I have given this talk, uh, this, this particular verse, I have done it once, once in, in Raleigh, North Carolina. I thought it's just one verse will be enough, one hour will be enough for it. I went through it for one hour and 40 minutes and still couldn't finish it. So don't worry, I won't keep you for one, an hour, one hour and 40 minutes. Um, <coughs> But we'll see as much as we can do. Remember, it's just one straight, simple straight message. The verse is the 12th verse of the first chapter. It goes like this. Atma sakshi vibhu purnaha Eko mukta shtidakriyaha Asanga nispriha shanto Brahmat samsara vaniva. What does that mean? Atma. You see, what is Vedanta about? Atma means the self. Even when you say the self, it still sounds pretty philosophical and abstract. It means you. It literally means you. You know, in, in Indian languages, the word Atma has got other meanings. Um, some people think Atma means the the departed ones, the ghost, or something like that. No, it just means you, your own self, right now, what you are. Vedanta is about yourself. Vedanta is not really about God. 
Vedanta is not about how this universe was created. These things are discussed, but only secondarily so. It's not about how this universe was created. It's not even about God. It's not even about karma, not even about heaven and how to go to heaven. No. Vedanta is centrally about you. Atma, about yourself. Why should that be interesting? Well, first of all, why shouldn't it be? What's the most inter interesting subject we have in the world? Ourselves. We ourselves. <laughs> so if, if it's something is entirely about you, you would be interested in it. But more than that, deeper than that, Vedanta says that all the purpose in life, whatever you're trying to do in secular life, in your jobs, in your relationships, in your day-to-day -day life, that happiness which you are seeking, that satisfaction and peace that you are seeking, we are all seeking that, and mostly ineffectually. I mean, all of us sitting here today, if you honestly look back upon our life from the earliest childhood till today, what else have been we trying to do except trying to be happy, trying to get some happiness, trying to avoid misery, overcome suffering. That's what we have been trying to do. And who amongst us? Somebody here is maybe 10 years old, somebody might be 90 years old. Who amongst us can claim honestly to oneself that I have succeeded, I have found it, I am perfectly at peace, I have uh, no, no sufferings in the world. Who can actually claim that? Vedanta is about that. And Vedanta makes the claim that if you knew yourself as you truly are, you would find that peace, that satisfaction. You would transcend suffering. Vivekananda, in this country, when he came here to this country, he would sometimes remark with, with a touch of pathos, he would say, if only you knew, your, knew yourself as you truly are. If only you knew yourself as you truly are. Meaning thereby, all our suffering would be overcome. What you want in life, you would get it if you knew yourself as you truly are. It also means, by implication, we do not know ourselves as we truly are. What we think about ourselves, our first reaction is, it's about me. Well, I, I know about myself. I'm sort of an authority on myself. After all, who else is an authority on me? Not your Vedanta. I am an authority about myself. Vedanta says you are wrong. You really do not know anything much about yourself. And what you know about yourself is wrong, not only wrong, it's the source of all your troubles. Mark Twain, I love this quote from Mark Twain. He said, it's not what we do not know that gets us into trouble. It's what we know that it just ain't so. <laughs> I am Brahman, I am one with God. No, it just ain't so. I'm just this guy. Vedanta says, no, that's where, where you are wrong. Vedanta is about Atma. One interesting idea about the Atma is that which literally it comes from Atti, to eat. To eat. To eat here means not literally to eat, it means to experience. We experience, we eat actually with our eyes, with our ears, with our tongue, of course with our sense of touch and smell, with our five sense organs, we are eating. That means all the inputs that pour into us. That which experiences eats the world of form and sound and taste and smell and touch. That is Atma. And that's only in the waking stage, right now. When you go to sleep and you dream, you, you see people and things and things happen to you, uh, good dreams and nightmares and things like that. There also you are eating the subtle forms, not, not with your sense organs, but in your mind. All the images and things, the dreams generated in your mind. That's also an experience. You're still experiencing, but with the mind only, not with the physical senses. And then when we sleep, when we slip into deep sleep, waking, dreaming, deep sleep, when we slip into deep sleep, Blankness. There also you are eating. In one, the, uh, the Upanishadic word is Ananda Bhuk. You experience. You, you let us say eat. Experience the peace and the quietness and the blankness. The absence. Uh, deep sleep is not an absence of experience. It's an experience of absence. Uh, 
So there also, that which eats in the waking state, through this body and through the five senses right now, in the dream state, in your mind, and in deep sleep, in that blankness and restfulness, the one continuous thing, that is the Atma. Atma. Sri Ramakrishna, some people say, you know, all this Vedanta you're teaching, but Sri Ramakrishna taught a simple religion of bhakti, of love, of God. True. There is a collection of Sri Ramakrishna's sayings. Um, I always carry it in my, yeah, I've got it, thank God, in my pocket. <laughs> Wherever I go, I take it. This is the sayings of Sri Ramakrishna. It's the only book that Swami Brahmananda ever wrote. I think it's translated into English as words of the master, a small book. So it's a, just the choicest sayings of Sri Ramakrishna collected by Swami Brahmananda. And the simple devotee of Kali, the lover of God. You know what's the first saying in this book? The very first one. I'll read out the first sentence in Beng Bengali and then translate. First saying in this book. Manush apna ke chinte parle, Bhagavan ke chinte parle. When a, a, a human being, a person, when this person knows himself or herself, that person knows God. When you know yourself, you know God. This is Sri Ramakrishna. Atma, the self. If you would know yourself as you truly are, you realize God. You go beyond suffering. You attain permanent bliss. So, so important to know the self. Now, our first reaction is, I know myself, who am I? I'm this person, this body, this mind. The next word, Atma, Sakshi, Vibhu, Purnaha, Sakshi, the next word. What is the self? Is it this bundle of flesh and blood? Is it the person in this body? The mind, the intellect, the memories, the likes and dislikes, the knowledge. The person I think I am, is, is that the self? Or is it something beyond that? According to Vedanta, you are, the, the real self is the witness consciousness. It is that which experiences. I said which experiences in the waking state, in the dream state, in the deep sleep state, the one unchanging experiencer, which enables all experience. What does that mean? Take a simple, simple methodology. Uh, it's a philosophical inquiry into who am I. A technique. Remember, there are many such techniques in Vedanta. They are called prakriya techniques and methodologies. Take one. This, this te technique is called the technique of the seer and the seen. Drig drishya viveka. A simple technique. What does it say? Remember, the purpose is to discover atma, the real self. Ken Wilbur has written a book, The Atman Project. Atman Project. It's about discovering who we really are. What does this method say? It says this. Follow this carefully. It says, you are that which experiences. That which is experienced is not you. I'll repeat that. It's pretty simple. Anything that you experience, it's not you, not the real self, not Atma. That which experiences is the Atma. What you see is not yourself. The one who sees is you. Drik Drishya literally means the seer and the seen. Differentiating the seer and the seen. Do you see it? Yes, then it's not you. Did you experience it? Yes, then it's not the Atma. It is something that the Atma experienced. Simple, a simple operating procedure. Simple uh, methodology, but it will have tremendous implications when you actually use it. Let's use it. Take a look around yourself here. This room, the things that you see, you know it. Even without any Vedanta, you know it's not me. Clearly. We don't think, I don't think I'm this lectern or the microphone or even this cloth or even the shirt that I'm wearing. I don't think it's me. But the real problem for us starts with the body. 
Sometimes we say, we are this body. What's this? It's me. Who are you? This. So this body is me. I am this body. It starts with this. But let's use the method. What did the method say? That if you experience it, it's not you. If it's an object of your awareness, it's not you. Are you aware of the body? Yes. I can see the body. I can feel the body. I can touch the body. Sometimes, unfortunately, you can even smell the body. So, the body is definitely an object of my, an object of my experience. And using that, that methodology, that which you experience is not yourself, is not the self, not the Atma. If I experience the body, then the body is not the self. It's an object of experience. Okay, good. Let's look deeper. With what are you seeing the body? Here is the body. And what am I seeing the body with? With the eyes, which are also part of the body. Am, can I experience the eyes, the sensory system, the ears, eyes, tongue? and Do I experience that? True. We experience it. My eyes are open. Do I not experience it? My eyes are closed. I need glasses. I can't see too well. Ex the eyes and its various conditions are experienced by me. If it's an object of experience, the eyes are an object of experience. In that case, I am not the sensory system either. The eyes and the same applies for the ears and the nose and the tongue and the sense of taste, taste touch. So I'm not the, experience, the, the, um, the sensory system as well. What experiences the sensory system? Clearly the mind. The mind is thinking about the eyes and the body. So am I the mind? And it, this is where most educated, sensitive, thinking people would stop. Yeah, I am the mind. I am this person. Thoughts, my thoughts, feelings, emotions, memories. This is what constitutes the person which I call myself. But do you experience that? Can you look inside and experience your own thoughts? Can we experience our feelings? Of course we can. In fact, feelings are directly experienced by us. I am happy. Do I experience happiness? You can, I can never say, we can never say that I am very happy, but I don't feel it. It sounds very, very strange. Yeah. I am miserable, but of course I don't feel a bit of it. No. Happiness, misery, pain, our sensations and emotions are directly experienced by us. If they are directly experienced by us, the constituents of our minds are directly experienced by us. In that case, the minds are also an object of experience for us. It's an object of experience for you. Are you with me so far? That to which the mind is an object of experience. See, this table is an object of experience to my eyes. My eyes and the body are an object of experience to my mind. And my mind is an object of experience. I cannot deny it. It's a, it's a fact. To what? That awareness which experiences the mind from within. That awareness which cannot be objectified. That is called, for want of a better term, because it witnesses, it shines upon, illumines every movement of the mind, every thought, every idea, every mem memory, every feeling. It's called the witness. In Sanskrit, Sakshi. Sakshad Ikshate. Which sees directly, which experiences directly. What does that mean? It is that witness consciousness with the, through the mind which experiences the body. It is the witness consciousness through the, through the mind and the sense organs which enables me to see you. The witness consciousness directly experiences the mind. But for us to experience the world, we need the instrumentation of the mind and the sense organs. Not directly. We do not experience the world directly. Through some, some instruments. You want to see bacteria, you need a microscope. You want to see the far stars, you need a powerful telescope. Through an instrument. But the witness consciousness directly illumines whatever is closest to it. So the mind is closest to the witness consciousness and the mind is directly illumined by the witness consciousness. Sakshi which experiences, which shines directly upon our minds. You might say, well, I can sort of 
So yeah, I think I know what you mean. I have a sakshi, a witness consciousness. Not that you have a sakshi, you are the witness consciousness. We often tend to, the mind plays a trick, you know, in order to pr preserve its primacy, its importance in the scheme of things. It tends to sidestep it. Yes, Swami, I understand what you are saying. The Atma, the Sakshi is very good, no problems. But I have some problems. You are the Sakshi, you are the witness consciousness. The witness consciousness, the Sakshi, is not like my liver or my, or my uh, um, lungs. Or, no, it's me, the real me. It's you with the Sakshi, the, the, the Sakshi with the mind, which is the person. You are not even the person. You are that within which is aware of the person. The very term Sakshi is very powerful. It shows you what liberation is, what enlightenment is, what freedom is. The person never gets freedom. That might sound shocking. The person never gets moksha or nirvana. You get freedom from the person. You, the witness consciousness, you realize you are free of the person. The person will continue. Who is the person? It's that, that ever-changing, that uh, continuously transforming set of ideas, likes and dislikes, memories, tendencies. Right now, the person, imagine, the person has changed so much from babyhood to childhood to teenage to youth to middle age to senior. So it changes so much. And yet, there is a light within which lights up this person. That light within is the Sakshi. Very precise way of isolating the Sakshi, of, of, of seeing yourself for what you are. Use the same technique. That which I, am not, which I am aware of is not me. Aware of the body, then the body is not me. Aware of the mind, then the mind, which I think to be myself, that's also not me. In fact, in Vedanta, the mind is called a subtle body. The mind is also a body. Just like we have the feeling of being embodied. That I am in this body, embodied. Vedanta would say, you are also in the mind. I don't know, you, can, you cannot concoct a new term, en-minded or something. But basically, Vedanta would say, you are embodied in a physical body, a gross body. By gross, I don't mean the body is gross. It may be very fit and very nice. But... Physically, it's, it's a physical uh, body. And I'm also embodied in a subtle body. Mind, intellect, memory, ego. Very interesting. Ego. What is the ego? The one which says I. You say, I am sitting on the chair. Right now, if you say that, I am sitting on a chair. It seems to be a fact. But apply the same technique. Are you aware of this feeling of I am sitting on the chair? Which means that I, which you are aware of, that's also an object. That I, which you are, we are all aware of the I inside. I am speaking. Okay, this I. I am aware of it. In that case, that I is also an object. Are you with me? No? Just feel it. I, sitting on the chair. I. It's an object. A very subtle object, but still an object. That which is aware, which shines on the eye, on the, ob the very subtle object called the eye, that one is the sakshi, the witness. So the witness is something beyond the ego also. Not the body, not the mind. The illuminer of the body-mind and through the body-mind of the universe. That unchanging consciousness is called the sakshi. Swami, why did you say unchanging? I said unchanging because... Every change is illumined by that consciousness. If that consciousness were to change, if you are aware of that change, then the change becomes an object to that consciousness. It's not, the consciousness is not changing. It illumines a change. The change is an object different from that consciousness. By, by logic, by simple logic, you can see that the, that consciousness is unchanging. But remember, it's not an object. It's not a thing. If it were a thing, it would be separate from you. Sakshi. In fact, if you use this technique, whatever I am aware of, that I am not. That much. Then you see that you are not the body, you are not the senses, you are not the vital force, the breath, prana. 
You are not the mind, you're not the intellect. You can see, because you're all aware of all of them. You're aware of all of these. You are not. If you stop there, if you stop right there, you've got Buddhism. When Buddhism says, there is no permanent self, anatma. Often people say there's a great conflict between Hinduism and Buddhism, and they've debated this for more than a thousand years. There's rich flowering of Indian philosophy for more than a thousand years of debate between the Hindu dualist schools and the various Buddhist schools. Hindus speak about an Atma. Look at this, what we just read, Atma. And the, the Buddhists say Anatma, no self. But you know, when you look at it from a non-dualist perspective, it's virtually, you're saying virtually the same thing. One, they're coming at, at it from a negative side, one from a positive side. And there is merit on both sides. It's a digression, I know, but let, let me make this point. The advantage of the Buddhist point is that I just said that the real self, the Sakshi, is not a thing, not an object. If you listen to it the way, the way we speak about it in Vedanta, the way the Hindus speak about it, you get the feeling it's something. It's a thing. Something rarefied, something very subtle, but still a thing. If you take it from the Buddhist perspective, you see it's not a thing, not an object. That correction, that correction happens if you ground your, if you take the Buddhist approach. It's not a thing. They are right. It's not a thing. Absolutely they are right. It's not a thing. It's not an object. But on the other hand, if you stick closely to the Buddhist approach, you get the feeling it's nothing. But it's not nothing either. The Buddhists themselves say that. Nagarjuna says, what's the highest? He, he says the ultimate truth, tattvam. The ultimate truth is shunyam, the void. What is the void? Is it something that exists? He says, no. So it does not exist? No. It both exists and does not exist? No. It neither exists nor does not exist? No. Chatush koti vinir mukta tattvam. The shunyam, the void, is something beyond the four alternatives. If you take the Buddhist approach, you realize it's not an object. But you, get, you run the danger of thinking it's nothing. But the Buddhists themselves say that shunyam, the void, is not nothing. Then the Hindu approach is useful. You say that it's not nothing. It's the witness of that so-called nothing. Often in spiritual life, you can end up with a vacuum, a void, a shunyam. And at that point, if you take this Vedantic approach, what is aware of this void? It's not another thing. It's something beyond all things, beyond all objects. So, Sakshi, the witness consciousness. Atma Sakshi Vibhu Purnaha. Vibhu, a very interesting word in Sanskrit. Vibhu generally means which pervades all things. In all, in all variety, that one reality in all variety. This pure consciousness, if you, read, if you read about it this way, the way we have talked about it, the, the, the sense you get is, it's something very subtle beyond the body. It's not the body, it's not the mind, it's not um, the intellect. It's a, some kind of a very rarefied light which shines upon the mind and body, different from everything in the universe. And now Ashtavakra says, he reverses it. This whole universe is not different from you, the Sakshi. You see, the moment you say witness, you, usually what is a witness? A witness is the, is the one who steps back from everything and sees things at a distance, right? A witness to a crime, a witness to the event, somebody not involved, separate, something different. The word vibhu means that which has become everything. So it's not only the light, the consciousness, which illumines all experiences, but everything that is experienced, that is also a projection of the same Atman. It is the same Sakshi, the same witness, with variety of names and forms. That's difficult to understand. But without this, there would be no non-duality. Vibhu, the different ways of understanding this term. Vividham bhavati vibhu. The one which has become variety. Not become, but seems to be this variety. You are the witness consciousness. And what you experience, that also you are. This is the meaning of the next term. Shocking. It means, 
I am not a consciousness apart from the universe, shining upon the universe in my isolated majesty, separated from everything in the universe. The great German philosopher, he talked about monads, Leibniz, yeah. like stars in the night sky, apart from the rest of the universe, shining upon everything, not affected by everything else. But not just that, the whole universe is an appearance in your light. It's not apart from you. What you see around this is you yourself. It is by your own maya that you project this entire universe in your awareness. And you are the witness of this game. So vibhu, vividham bhavati, that which appears as manifold. Viruddham bhavati, viparitam bhavati, contradictory, just the opposite. That pure consciousness appears as this insentient thing of wood of metal, of earth and sky and fire and water. Just the opposite of consciousness, a material existence. Viparitam bhavati, opposite. It appears as an opposite reality. Vivartam bhavati. In Sanskrit, vivartam means without changing appears as something else. The rope, the classic example in Vedanta, the rope without changing appears as a snake, right? In Vedanta, old example, and they say that um, a boy ran away from a village in India to become a monk. And his relatives, they went out to search for him. One man came back to the village having found that boy. He said, yes, he's in an ashram. He is studying Vedanta. He's become a monk. Oh, the villagers were very curious. What, what do they do in that ashram? What do they do? Well, they have a problem with snakes. Every day in the morning, there's this rope which is covered by a snake, and they, the, the monks spend a lot of time driving the snake away, but next morning it's back again. It's the rope which is mistaken for the snake. Rope alone appears as the snake. This is called vivartha, the rope without having changed. The rope doesn't change. The rope is what it is, always. It looks like the snake, by mistake. Similarly, you, the consciousness, the sakshi, the witness consciousness, you appear as what is witnessed. Mind, body, universe. That witness consciousness appears as this universe. It might seem difficult to swallow, but think, think about it. It's not very alien to our experience. Every day when we dream about it, we, when we dream, we do something like that. Isn't it? When you dream, you see buildings and streets and trees and sky and birds and people and good and bad. And you are also there in your own dream. You have a body, right? A dream body in your own dream. Isn't it true that everything that we see in our dreams is our own mind? The mind which is seeing the dream and that which is the dream is composed of, it's the same mind. The mind itself projects its own movie and watches it. You are like the, you are like that audience which watches its own movie. You, know, you create your own movie and you watch it. So, Sakshi Vibhuhu, entire universe appears to you in your consciousness. Vividam Bhavati, Vivaktam Bhavati, Viparitam Bhavati, the different ways of understanding Vibhu. And what else? Atma, Sakshi, Vibhu, Purnaha, complete. Purna means full or infinite. There is this uh, peace chant, Shanti Mantra, which um, is my favorite really. You might have heard it. Purna madha, Purna midam, Purnat, Purna mudachyate, Purnasya, Purna madhaya, Purna meva vashishyate. From the whole or the infinite. From that infinite, this infinite has emerged. That, that is infinite, this is also infinite. And having taken the infinite from the infinite, the infinite alone remains. What does that mean? You, the witness consciousness, and this universe, that which is witnessed. This universe which is witnessed is an emanation, is a projection from you, the witness consciousness. Take, and this universe, what you experience as this in the world, the manifest universe, you and subject and object, this is infinite. It's that same Brahman. Beyond name and form, in itself as existence, consciousness, bliss, that is also the same Brahman. That is infinite, this is also infinite. 
This infinite has emerged or is projected from that infinite. That infinite, if you take the infinitude of this infinite, if you, if you take the infinitude of this infinite, you recognize Brahman in this very infinite. Then what remains? The infinite alone remains. In this very experience, if you recognize existence, consciousness, bliss, then existence, consciousness, bliss alone remains. Purnam eva vashishyate. That Purnam. You see, our whole samsara, our whole samsara, samsara means this worldly existence of trial and tribulation and suffering and unsatisfactoriness. This whole samsara. This is because we do not know our own infinitude. We see ourselves as this limited person. The moment you see us, yourself as this limited person, I am this body, then every problem of the body becomes my problem. This, bra- this body is getting, um, it's sick, I am sick. It's hungry, I am hungry. It's getting old and diseased, I am old and diseased. It's going to die, I am going to die. Because I am this body. When we lose our infinitude, when we lose means we, we lose sight of our infinitude, and we, we experience this body, and we think, I am this one. Then samsara starts for us. Why? Not seeing ourselves as complete, desire arises. A desire for completion. I am subject to death. I must live. Struggle for life. I am subject to hunger and thirst. I seek, seek satiety. I seek food and sustenance. I am subject to the mind, the 101 desires of the mind. I want this and I want that. Otherwise, I will be unhappy. Then everything that the mind throws up, fancies, fears, frustrations, they all become my fears, my anxieties, my frustrations, my desires. Not knowing my completion, my infinitude, I think I'm finite. I'm born and I shall die. I'm limited to this much space. This, this is all that I am. Here is this wide world before me. So I feel threatened and small and, and unsatisfied. And I struggle for satisfaction. I struggle for security. Wittgenstein once said, religion is a search for absolute security. Vedanta says, as if in reply to Wittgenstein, you already have that absolute security. You just have to become aware of it. You have it. Nothing can touch you at all. Not knowing your purnatvam, your completion, desire comes. Desire is kama. And when desire comes, from desire comes action, karma. And when we have karma, action, action will give rise to results. To experience the results of our actions, we are born again and again. So Shankaracharya says, avidya kama karma. Again and again he uses the phrase. Avidya means ignorance. Ignorance of what? Our purnatvam, our, comp- our infinitude. You are not at all conscious. We are not conscious. We are not aware of our infinitude. Not being conscious about that, desire arises, karma. From desire arises action prompted by desire. And the results of that are our lives. So samsara comes from not knowing our, our infinitude, purnatvam. And Ashtavakra says, Atma sakshi vibhu purnaha. The end of the verse, he says, Brahmat samsara vaniva. By illusion, by mistake, by error, you seem to have samsara. Samsara means this unsatisfactory life that we seem to lead. It's an error. You do not, you are not a samsara. You are not trapped in samsara. You're completely free even now. But you do not know it. That not knowing leads to the error that I am a samsari, that I am in the midst of samsara. Not knowing what? Not knowing that you are the sakshi, the witness, what do we feel? We feel, I am the doer and I am the experiencer. In Sanskrit, karta bhokta. Right knowledge, correct knowledge, sakshi, witness. Error, brahma, delusion, karta bhokta. Doer, the agent of actions and the experience of results. I experience pleasure, I experience pain. You would say, but that seems to be true. 
Is it? Is it? Look a little deeply. A little investigation will, will, will show you the, the amazing truth beneath our day-to-day -day experiences. I sip a cup of coffee and I say, oh, what a nice cup of coffee. I experience pleasure. So did you not experience pleasure? Are you aware that you experienced pleasure? Yes. What is it that is aware of you, the mind, through the sense organs, drinking coffee and experiencing the flash of pleasure? There is an awareness, a background awareness to the whole show. Did that background awareness have pleasure? Is it the one in pain or in pleasure? No. It is the illuminer of the experience of pain and pleasure. When I say, I am standing here and speaking to you, if I look inwards, I am quite clear that this whole experience of I standing here and speaking to you, the whole thing is in my awareness. The one which is aware of I standing here and speaking, that one is not standing and speaking. That one is illumining it. The real you is not, an, not a bhokta experiencer. You enable the experience. The real you is not a doer, karta. You enable the karta, you enable it, it to function. Not knowing that, not knowing yourself as the witness of all experiences, you become samsari. Brahmat samsara vaniva. Vibhuhu, purna, I am infinite, I am the whole universe is experienced in me. You see, that's not true. Our general way of understanding is, here is the universe spread out in front of me, here is the body, in the body is me, the mind or the person, and through this body I'm experiencing the universe. Wrong idea. We think we are sparks of consciousness in a body. Consciousness in a body. But Vedanta says, take a close look at your experience. Where do you actually experience the body? Do you experience yourself as consciousness in a body or a body in consciousness? Are you aware of the body? Let, let's I, I ask a simple question. Are you aware of the body? If you are aware of the body, isn't it fair to say you are aware of the body in your awareness? Where is the body? In your awareness. You see, I'm, I'm aware of this bottle of water. This bottle is in my awareness. Similarly, the body is in my awareness. Vedanta wants you to change the perspective. You are not awareness in a body. In fact, if you would look at your experience, you would find it more true to say that I am aware of a body in my awareness. There is a body in my awareness. There are thoughts in my awareness. You are awareness which is aware of bodies and minds and thoughts and things. Instead of thinking of yourself as awareness in a body, think of it as a body in your awareness. That's the step towards Vedanta. Not only body in awareness, everything that we experience through the, bo through the body, is it not in awareness? If it was not in my awareness, how would I experience it? Vedanta says that Take this simple fact and dwell on it. Everything that you have seen in your life has been seen and experienced in your awareness. And in fact, Vedanta says, well, why say in your awareness? Why say in my awareness? In me, the awareness. Our mistake is, samsara is, I am a body with awareness. Vedanta wants you to say, I am awareness, aware of a body. Just reverse it and see which is closer to the truth. If you are awareness, aware of a body, then you are aware of the pain and the misery of the body. It's in your awareness. The awareness is not in pain. Brahma, delusion, this error that when we think of... See, so somebody asked a Vedanta teacher, you are saying that I am all-pervading consciousness, but that's not true. It sounds nice, it sounds cool, but is it true really? Because I am here. I'm not there. I'm here. I'm not there. How can you say my consciousness is all-pervading? What did the teacher reply to that, that question? Simple reply. Think about it. You are saying, I am here, I am not there. The teacher said, 
here and there, are they both not in your awareness? Here, the concept of space, here and there, both are in awareness. You are thinking because of the body-centeredness, you're thinking, I am here and I'm not there. But here and there, both are, are concepts, are experiences in your awareness. Is it not so? Think about it. It's a very strange way of experiencing things, but it's true. If you look at the dream example, in the dream, the entire thing which you dream, suppose you're dreaming all this, then you think that I am here and this building is outside. But when you wake up, you would see that the building outside, inside, all were in my head. That's true. Brahmat samsara vaniva. As if you are a samsari. By, completely by error. You're not really a samsari, not really trapped in samsara. All of samsara shines in you, the sakshi, in you, the witness consciousness. Atma sakshi vibhu purna ekaha mukta chid akriyaha. I'm almost out of time, but let me run through it quickly anyway. How many atmas, how many witnesses? Our first reaction would be to say, okay, I am one witness of this body and mind. There's another one, there's another one. There are so many bodies, so in each one of them, there must be a separate witness. Vedanta says only one witness, in which many bodies, many minds shine. But you are one, one consciousness. In the Gita, 13th chapter, Kshetra Kshetra Gya, the field and the knower of the field, Krishna says to Arjuna, Kshetra Gyam Chapi Maam Vidhi Sarva Kshetra Shubharata. What does that mean? In all these bodies and minds, how many consciousnesses are there? Krishna says to Arjuna, Know me alone to be the one consciousness in all bodies and minds. This question, this answer, this statement of Krishna's answers two profound questions. One is, how many selves, how many atma, how many witnesses, witness consciousnesses? One. And second, Vedanta is supposed to be some kind of religion somewhere. Where is God? You haven't mentioned God even once. This is the concept of God in Vedanta. The one consciousness in all bodies and minds. Krishna says, Kshetragyam chapi maam vidhi. Know me, Krishna, to be the one consciousness in all bodies and minds. So God is the one consciousness shining through all bodies and minds. This unity, this identity of self is what is called God or in, in technically in Vedanta, Saguna Brahman, Antaryami. Ekaha, we are all one existence. Muktaha, free. You see, the general idea is in, in uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, the Eastern religions, the goal is freedom, spiritual freedom. I must be free of body and mind. I must be free of the cycle of birth and death. Advaita Vedanta says, you already are free. All that you need to know is that you know that you are free. You ever, you were free, you are free, and you will always be free. General idea in, in, um, in the sp spiritual life in Hinduism or other Eastern religions is, you go through a lot of spiritual practices and then you attain freedom. That seems to be logical. Oh, I am I'm bound by suffering, by birth and death and so on and so forth. And I shall attain freedom. Astavakra says, the real truth is you are already free. Only problem, the little, little hitch is that you don't know it. <laughs> Brahmat samsara vaniva. By error you think you are trapped in samsara. The Conventional idea of freedom in spirituality is I'm trapped in birth and death and after a lot of spiritual practice I'll be enlightened and I will get moksha, freedom. So I had many births and deaths, now it has stopped, I'm free from births and deaths. That's the idea in Eastern philosophies. What Ashtavakra says is, this is for kindergarten children, for the other room. <laughs> but for you who are veterans in Vedanta, let me give you the real deal. The real muktaha, moksha, real freedom is that not that I was trapped in birth and death in a cycle of, uh, uh, of existences and now I'm free from it. Rather, there was no birth and no death for me. I was never born, never died, 
Not if I am I born now. Birth and death are of the body. And even the body and mind are also appearances in that consciousness. They are not even real in themselves. So I am already free. I always was free and ever will be free. Uh, the enlightenment is just realizing this. Yeah. That is a PhD level enlightenment. <laughs> Muktaha. One of our monks in, in Uttarkashi, he was discussing with other monks that, you know, that um, our Eastern religions speak about many lives, births and deaths, and freedom from the cycle of birth and death, whereas the Abrahamic religions speak about one life, and this concept of birth and death is not there, many lives is not there, reincarnation. In Hindi, punar janma. After some time, the monks in our cottage there, they got irritated with him. And how long can you go on listening to these? So they stopped listening to his arguments. So he took his, uh, his debating outside. And there was a great teacher of non-dualist Vedanta in an ashram nearby. So this monk, he took it to him and said, Swami, here are the arguments in favor of many lives, punar janma. And here are the arguments against. And that Swami listened to him carefully for a minute or two. And then he said, I'll tell you in Hindi and translate back into English. That Swami said, Are Mahatma Ji, Jab janm hi nahi to punar janm kahe ka? My dear Swami, when there is not even one birth, where is the question of rebirth? Aap mandukya padhiye, go and read mandukya Upanishad. <laughs> and this Swami came and told me, the one who, was, who got this snub, he said, oh, it's, very, it's impossible to talk to these non-dualists. They'll immediately take every, no, they can, you cannot have a serious discussion with them. They'll take every question to Brahman and Maya. <laughs> Is there one life and one death, or many lives and many deaths? And the answer was, there isn't even one life. What to speak about many lives? There is only Brahman, that one light, one existence consciousness place. Brahmat samsara vaniva. It's only out of simple uh, delusion, that ignorance of this fact, that we seem to be trapped in samsara. Asangaha. Asanga means non-attached. Non-attachment is not that you are supposed to practice non-attachment. I'll stop here, don't worry. I'm not going to go on for one and a half hours. It's not that you're supposed to practice non-attachment. It's a good practice. But what Ashtavakra is telling us is you are non-attached. You already are. Notice the fact. Nothing sticks to you. Grandparents and parents have come and gone. If they have not gone, they'll go. Bad news, but yes. People come and go. Things come and go. Youth comes and goes. This body also comes and goes. Pleasant experiences come and go. Become memories. Memories come and go. Nothing sticks to you. You're completely non-attached. Some people say, no, Swami, we are not monks. We are very attached to our near and dear ones. Take the example of the greatest attachment possible in human life. A young mother with her baby. The strongest possible attachment. She's all about taking care of the child. But even when that mother falls asleep, and, and I, I'm given to understand it's not an easy thing for a young mother to fall asleep. You don't get much sleep when there's a baby in the house. But when you finally do fall asleep, the thing which is dearest to you, your little baby, even that goes out of your mind. The whole world slips away and you slip into peaceful slumber with the greatest of relief and happiness. Yeah. Every day, the entire world slips away from our awareness. You are unattached to the universe. The entire universe, you are unattached is a fact. Everything, all of this is a show in the light that you are. Dances in front of you and disappears. Don't catch on to it and say that this is who I am. This body is who I am. This will also change and disappear after some time. Asangaha. This witness consciousness, the Atman which you are, is completely detached. You don't have to be detached. You don't have to practice non-attachment. Just recognize the fact that you're not attached to anything in the universe. One of the monks whom I revere very much, my, like my mentor, you know, I, I became, I joined the order under him. Very wonderful monk. I mean, so disciplined, very hardworking, lot of service he has done, 
regular in his meditation, in his prayer, in his studies, in his worship. All the yogas, you know, karma yoga, raja yoga, bhakti yoga, jnana yoga, all of them are manifested in his life. Wonderful Swami. And I asked him once, what's your spiritual practice? Not me, somebody else asked him. But his answer was very remarkable. The one who does so many things, he said, I have only one practice. Only one thing in life I hold on to, detachment. Asangaha. It's your very nature. Your nature is its... To all the dreams that you see, you are continuously detached. The snake which appears on the rope, is the rope attached to the snake? There is no snake. What will it be attached to? So similarly, everything in the universe, it's not being cold and uh, you know, unattached and cold and indifferent. It's just recognizing the truth that all of these are experiences which shine it, in, 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 in me, the awareness. It is equally true to say, I am one with everything. One position. I am completely detached from everything. Another position. Both are exactly the same thing. If you understand both to be the same thing, you have understood non-dualism. Otherwise, brahmat samsara vaniva, as if trapped in samsara, by delusion, by error, by confusion. I could go on, but you can see, Ashtavakra's trend is this, you know, that there is one message which he keeps on hammering again and again and again. So, do we have uh, um, questions and answers? No? Yeah. We have? All right. Well, what, is the, what is the protocol? Do we go straight into, segue into questions and answers? All right, go ahead. I'd love it. Question. I'll, I'll stop you right there. Okay. Note that I never said you are the director. You are not the director. You are the light. Imagine, light focusing, of falling on a screen and you see a movie. The light is not the director of the movie. The light is this very substance of the movie, the light and the screen. You are the movie itself. You are that in which the movie appears. But the plot of the movie is not in your hand. There's a big difference. If you talk about the plot of the movie, that's the director. That's the director, the Oscar winning director is God, Ishwara, Saguna Brahman. The point I'm trying to make is, whatever you see here, Whatever you experience, including your own body and your own mind and your personality, they are all in your awareness or in you, the awareness. And they are not different from that awareness. What actually happens, the moment you become interested in the story itself, you're trapped in samsara. What I'm trying to say is, it's a movie. You are the screen, not the director. What I'm trying to say is, it's a book, it's, it's a story, it's a, it's a novel. You are the paper on which the novel is written. You are not part of the novel, you're not a character in the novel. The screen is not a character in the movie, but it enables the entire movie to play. Without the screen, no movie. Without the pages, no book. Yeah. It might seem nice to think I am the director let alone being the director of the entire universe, not even really the director of your own dreams. We have limited control over our own dreams also, which we clearly we imagine our dreams, but it's very difficult to control our dreams also, let alone this entire universe. In the universe, if you say who controls it, in the universe there is a process of um, cause and effect, causality, karma, and that is executed by what is called Ishwara, Bhagavan. But you need not go into all of that, because karma, Ishwara, all of them depend on you, the consciousness. That enables the movie to play. But only thing that you need to know is, first of all, you are the reality. Everything else that you experience is a movie in you. 
You are Brahman, the reality. Brahma Satyam, Brahman is the reality. This entire life that you experience, Jagat, it's called Jagat. Mithya, it's an appearance, it's a movie. And you are the reality behind the movie. That's all you need to know. After that, enjoy the movie. Yes. Okay, it's not a practice. Note one thing, it's knowledge. You're supposed to know it. I remember, um, you know, when, when we become monks, we are given, um, we are initiated into certain, uh, they, they are called the Mahavakyas, the ultimate truth, expression of truth. You know, Tattvamasi, that thou art, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. So after a group of monks were such initiated, it was in the 80s, they went to Swami Gambhiranandaji, who was the president of the Ramakrishna order at that time, the young monks, newly minted monks. And they asked, um, we have a question. That yesterday we were initiated into sannyasa, into the order of monasticism. And one of the things we were given is the Mahavakya, the great saying of the Upanishads, I am Brahman. Is it like a mantra? How many times do you have to repeat it? How many times? Practice. Practice. How many times do you have to repeat it? And Swami Gambhirananda, who was famous for being very brief, she said, it is not for repetition, it's for realization. Next question. <laughs> now your question is about spiritual, I'll come to you, about spiritual practice. All practices, from a non-dualistic point of view, from Advaita Vedanta point of view, all practices lead up to this knowledge. This is a knowledge. And, and this no, if you ask, then, okay, how do I come about? Or how do I really get this knowledge? Shravana, manana, nididhyasana. Hear these truths again and again. Think about them. Meditate deeply upon them. It's a very common sense procedure. Here there's Brown University. You go into a particularly difficult math class or physics class. You say, how do I get this knowledge? What will they tell you? Come to class. Read the books and think deeply about it. Shravana, manana, nididhyasana. But all other things are practices which, will, which culminate in this. For this, you need an especially refined and quiet mind. A very controlled and deep mind. For any higher pursuit, for science and for art and for any higher creative pursuit, you need a disciplined and quiet mind. I was just reading this article recently about some of the pioneers of Silicon Valley, one of the founders of Facebook, one of the founders of this, um, this uh, Twitter or something. They're actually turning off. They're, they're, have you read that article? They're, they're pulling out of it. They're rationing themselves. The founders of these technologies, they, found that they, they, they see that the deleterious effects of, of this on their own functioning. So a quiet mind is necessary for enlightenment. For quiet mind, meditation. Meditation is recommended. Chitta ekagrata, meditation is necessary for a quiet mind. What do you need a quiet mind for? besides all everything else, all benefits. But for enlightenment, for spiritual knowledge, non-dual realization, a concentrated, pure, refined, quiet mind is necessary. For that, the practice is meditation. Deep devotion, prayer, and surrender to God is a wonderful basis for non-dualism. One of the texts on non-dualism begins with, Ishvara Anugraha Deva Pumsam Advaita Vasana. It is by the special grace of God that you have a desire for non-duality. It's a blessing of God. So devotion to God, your religious practices. That's why I said, Ashtavakra, be careful. So this question will definitely come after listening to Ashtavakra for a while. What's the use of all these practices then? So devotion to God, bhakti, wonderful. Wonderful help to non-duality. Shankaracharya says, of all the qualifications, the, the resources you need for non-dual realization, devotion to God is primary. Bhakti. Non-duality may seem to be just the opposite of a dualistic religion. So non-dual realization is, is greatly benefited by dualistic devotion. Karma yoga, unselfish action. 
another very powerful uh, uh, sadhana, spiritual practice, which helps non-duality. Imagine, what is karma yoga? What is ordinary karma? I am this body and mind, and everything that I do is centered around this body and mind. Why do I work? Because I am this body, I have to feed this body. I have to do it for my family. My family related to the body. See, everything is centered around the body. My, I need a house. I need clothes. I need friends. My family related to the body. My friends and co-workers related to the body. My um, gender, my country, my nation related to the body. Our whole samsara is body-centric. Karma yoga reverses that. The practice of karma yoga. I shall work, I shall devote the energies of this body and mind and act for the welfare of others. Loka sangraha is a Sanskrit word used. Or as an action in service of the Lord. Karma yoga. So these are powerful practices which prepare the mind for non-dual realization. This, these practices are essential. These practices will not give you enlightenment. But without these practices, enlightenment is almost impossible to get. I use the word very carefully, almost. <laughs> but it, anybody who wants non-dual realization is well advised to continue spiritual practices. As a, you know, devotion leads to enlightenment. <laughs> uh, there's a funny story. The whole purpose of devotion is ultimately to lead you to non-dual realization. Of course, that's what we would say as non-dualists. The dualists would not say that. There's this person, it seems, who came to Ramana Maharshi, a funny, funny story. He said to, you know, you remember, you have heard of Ramana Maharshi who sta sat in the cave in Arunachala and who would advise, whatever you said he would advise you, find out who you are. If you ask this question, what is the, or should I meditate? He would say, who is asking this question? So who am I? Find out who am I? That was his answer. And he sat in this cave all the time and asked. So somebody came to Ramana Maharshi and said, I don't like this, who am I? You know, I am devoted to Narayana, Vishnu, to the Lord Vishnu. I have devotion to Lord Vishnu. I like to pray to Lord Vishnu and worship Lord Vishnu. Is that all right? And Ramana Maharshi said, yes, that's all right. Oh, it's all right. And after, so after death, I would like to go to Vaikuntha, the abode, the heaven, the abode of Lord Vishnu. Can I go? Ramana Maharshi says, if you like, you can go. <laughs> I can, yes. And there will I see the Lord? Yes, you will see. I see the Lord, yes. And will the Lord see me? Of course the Lord will see you. Oh, wow, that's wonderful. And will the Lord speak to me? Yes, the Lord will speak to you. Really? And what will the Lord say when he speaks to me? The Lord will say, find out who am I. <laughs> <laughs> find out who you are. That's what the Lord will say. So all those devotional practices, the meaning is, ultimately, it culminates in that. You had a question. Yeah. Swamiji Namaste. Namaste. Um, I have two questions. Okay. When you say Sakshi, is it same as Brahman, or is there any difference between these two terms? Okay, that's question number one. And yeah, second one? Number one. Second one is, I am Sakshi, hmm. but by error, I think I am Samsara. Yes. Yes. So, avidya in me. All right, two questions. First question is, the witness consciousness, is it the absolute reality that Vedanta speaks about? Is Sakshi Brahman? Sakshi is the witness consciousness, and Brahman is the absolute reality, existence consciousness place. Straight answer, yes. When in Vedanta, the central teaching of Vedanta is, Tattvamasi, that thou art, or Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. Now, to realize that I am Brahman, first of all, it, you cannot do it directly because I already have a wrong meaning of I in my mind. For me, I means body and mind. So if I say I am Brahman, I will think this particular person is Brahman. No, not true. Ultimately, yes. But in, that, in the, the way I am thinking, it's not true. Then what do I have to do? First, I have to discover the real I. That I am not the body, I am the witness of the body, I am not the mind, I am the witness of the mind. And finally come to the witness consciousness. That witness consciousness is Brahman. So when you say, I am Brahman, that I there refers not to that person, body-mind, but to the witness consciousness. So Sakshi and Brahman are the same thing. In a pot, the space in the pot, and the space all around, there is one space, unlimited and unbroken. It looks like there is space in the pot. And the space outside. But really, 
is there space in a pot? See, there is some space in this uh, bottle, and there's some water in this bottle. Did I make a correct statement? When I move this bottle, is the water in the bottle moving with it? Sure, otherwise it will make a terrible mess. The water stays here and the bottle moves. Out. Is the air in the bottle moving with it? If it's airtight, then the air inside the bottle, is it moving with the bottle? Some of you are not so sure. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's a fluid like anything else. Now here's the question. There's some space here also, right? There's space inside this bottle. When I move the bottle, does the space in the bottle move with the bottle? No. You think so, but it's not true. When you have an empty glass, when you move it, is the space inside the glass moving with the glass? It, you think so. No. It's the glass is moving through space. The glass is moving through space. Space does not move with the glass. You see? Similarly, the space is not bounded by that glass. Similarly, this pure consciousness, this witness consciousness, is not bounded by body and mind. Uh, it is uh, that unbounded witness consciousness is Brahman. Sakshi is Brahman. Now, next. Your question was, how do I realize that I am the Sakshi? How do I know this error that I have, where I think that I am some part of the Yes, the moment you are attached, when you think that you are the body-mind, you think you are the doer of your actions and you are the enjoyer or the experiencer of pleasure and pain. That's samsari. Karta bhokta is katritva bhoktitva is samsara. Now I'll lead you through, and it's not just for her. All of you, just try it. Who knows, we might just become enlightened. <laughs> How do I realize that I am not this, uh, you know, this person of body and mind? I'm the witness consciousness. How do I remove this error? Try it now. Here is the body. Look at the body. Is it a fact? I'm going to ask you a question. Do you notice it? And you have to say yes or no. Yes. And that the body, is it, it's there. I'm going to ask you, is it a fact? Is it something theoretical? She asked a question. That I have learned it in theory that I'm a witness consciousness, but, but how do I actually see it? So I'm going to ask you this question at every stage. Is it theoretical or is it a fact? So here's the body. Is it theoretical? <laughs> it's a fact. Yes, it's a fact. You don't even have to pinch it. You can see it. You can hear it. It's a fact. Not theoretical. So, I am the experiencer of the body. Right? Is it a fact? Yes. That you are experiencing the body? Yes. And using the, the, um, the methodology, that which experiences is different from that which is experienced. So, I am something which experiences this body. It's a body is an object in my experience. Step two. The mind is, actually we are thinking all this with the mind, correct? So the mind is experienced. Is it a fact or, or theory? Fact. Fact. That here is the mind. I'm, I'm thinking, thoughts, feeling, uh, remembering this mind. Is it a fact or is it theory? Fact. Think we are thinking. Yeah, but it's a fact, yeah. right? And is the mind experienced? Yes. Right now, if you just look, you think 2 plus 2 is 4? I am Swami, I'm thinking I'm Swami Sarva Priyananda. It's a thought, right? And you are experiencing your mind, is it not? Yes. Fact or theory? Fact. Fact. If you are experiencing the mind, that which is experiencing the mind cannot be denied. You may try to wriggle around it. Isn't it the mind experiencing the mind or something like that? But the fact is that something is experiencing the mind within me right now. And if it is true that the experiencer and the experienced are two different entities, then there must be something apart from the mind which is experiencing the mind right now. That experiencer of the mind is called the witness consciousness. At this point, follow this carefully, at this point, try to notice that carefully, you will never ever make it an object. You can make the body an object, you can make the mind an object, you can never make that witness an object because it's not an object. At this point, I'm going to ask you, is it a fact or not? 
the tendency will be to say that it's something that I learned from Vedanta, but it's something that I have to realize. I have to do a lot of spiritual practices, come to maybe a few more Vedanta classes, read a few more Vedanta books, and then I will be, one day there will be this halo around my head and I'll be. <laughs> what Vedanta says is, just as here, it's a fact. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, facts. That which experiences the thoughts, feelings and emotions is also equally and a fact right now. As much as a fact as this body. That witness consciousness is not a thing to be experienced later on, not a thing to be enlightened. I've just learned it theoretically, then I shall really experience it later. No, you are experiencing it right now. If you ever do get a separate enlightening experience, we all will, one day or the other, the breakthrough, that intuitive enlightening experience. In Vedanta it's called Brahma Karavritti. You know, the, the, the first thing that will strike us is, it was always there. Somehow I never noticed it. Enlightenment is, oh, now I have got something new. No, never. Non-dual enlightenment at least, Brahma Jnana, will always be, it was always there. Now I see it. Now I get it. The witness of your mind, of your experiences right now, is as much a fact as the mind, as the body. Right now. Try to dwell on that. Come, come to you. Yes, I'll come to you. Somebody must keep track of the who, who is in charge. There's nobody in charge? No, but when do we, we have, what's the next program? At what time? Six o'clock. Okay. We have gone well beyond time. Good, we have a very enthusiastic group of non-dualists here. We are 6.26. Let's take four minutes. We'll, we'll start in six three minutes more so that we'll get ready for Aarti at 6.30. Nobody told me, see, you have a very, <laughs> <laughs> quickly, the two questions for us, yes. Sir, so, um, you know, there's a Vedic statement that uh, the supreme being that was one decided to pretend to be many, and this is, you know, our discussion has, in a sense, a consciousness as well. Yeah. But, uh, so, I'm the universal consciousness, I'm divided, omnipresent, and to see myself as this body and mind complex is an error, whose error? Is it the error of this body and mind? All right. Two things. First of all, universal. Again, universal takes into account the fact that there is an universal so that I am, I am universal. But even the universe itself is an appearance. Uh, if you say omnipresent, look at the words you used. Omnipresent. That means pre present everywhere. Already taking into account the fact that there is space. Eternal. That takes into account the fact that there is time. Assuming space, I am omnipresent. Assuming time, I am eternal. But reali in reality, that, that uh, absolute is beyond time and space. But anyway, you cannot speak otherwise. You have to use the words of space and time. Now, your question was very deep. Whose error? Whose error is it? The absolute has no error. right? And you are saying that I am the absolute, so I also cannot have any error. This question, if you have followed Advaita Vedanta, this question should come. It should come. And uh, I can only respond the way Shankaracharya responds to this question. In the 13th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, a long discussion, at the end of it, the question is asked, this exact question, the opponent asks the question to Shankara. Whose error? The exact words are, whose ignorance? Who is ignorant then? Brahman cannot be ignorant. And you're saying, I am Brahman. So I also cannot be ignorant. So who is, uh, whose error is it? Who is in ignorance? And Shankara's answer is very interesting. He says, why are you asking? I'm asking because I don't know. Then you are in ignorance. You just admitted it. You don't know. <laughs> but I'm Brahman. But do you know that you're Brahman? Oh, no, not yet. Then your error. <laughs> you're ignorant. Then who am I? You're Brahman. <laughs> so there is an element of paradox there. And that's to be expected because that's Maya. That's the very nature of error. If it was cleanly ex explained, very neatly and rigorously put out there, it would be knowledge and not error. 
the very f you have discovered a fault line in the nature of reality that shows that there is error that there that shows that something is wrong that shows that we are in the matrix <laughs> question there last one Right. Would it be boring? <laughs> when you have questions like this, the first thing one needs to do is, very easy way of checking, is check with the lives of those you consider to be enlightened. And immediately you see their lives are more full. They are free of fear. We are driven by fear and desire and anxiety and terror. They're free of all of that. None of them seem ever seem to be bored. We are bored. Enlightened persons, the sages and saints of all mystical traditions throughout the history, one thing that they are not is bored. They're never bored. But will they have ambitions and desires? Yes and no. One deep point, all desires and ambitions are where? In the mind. So as witness consciousness, no ambitions and desires, ever. The mind with its ambitions and desires will continue to appear in the witness consciousness. It will continue. But it will generally be for the welfare of everybody. In Sanskrit, there's a term, loka sangraha. And the enlightened person will continue to act. We might even continue to harbor desires. Vivekananda wanted to establish Vedanta societies. Well and good that he did. We, we are here today. But if you ask that person, really, do you have any desire? No. Do you have a desire to establish Vedanta societies and do good to others? Yes. Both are true. One is true at the level of the mind of the projected individual, and the other one is an absolute reality, which is beyond all mind and desire. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Swami Savapriyananda, for that both um, very touching and practical exposition of one verse of the Ashtavakra Samhita. So we'll have you back and maybe one verse per Sunday can take you um, many visits to, to exercise the full document. <clears throat> uh, the programs will go on for the week as usual. This Tuesday, uh, our own Pritwish starts a two-part series on M, the Chronicler of the Gospels. Uh, there'll be no Friday lecture this week. Srikant will continue his uh, lectures on his inner and outer spiritual journey a week from Friday. Um, next Sunday, the program is Songs on the Divine Mother. It's a musical offering by Swapna and Raul Ray. That will be at 5 p.m. Uh, afterwards, there'll be a uh, gathering downstairs for soup supper. You can continue the discussion with uh, Swamiji. May the divine who is father in heaven of the Christians, holy one of the Jewish faith, Allah of the Muslims, Buddha of the Buddhists, Tao of the Taoists, great spirit of the Native Americans, Ahura Mazda of the Zoroastrians, and Brahman of the Hindus, lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality, May the all-loving being manifest himself unto us and grant us abiding understanding and all-consuming divine love. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. We'll now have arity.